okay, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. I am uh, Omar Al Baghajati and I'll be walking you through geriatrics um, for the SMLE course. So, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. We have um, total 10 topics. They're closely related to each other and we'll discuss them and I have one question regarding each one. Um, okay, so let, let us start now. So a 60-year-old man is brought to the emergency department with confusion uh, for two days. His symptoms have become uh, worse in the evening or become worse in the evenings and disturb his sleep. The patient is oriented to burn only, but not to place or time. On examination, he has psychomotor agitation, impaired attention, and impaired concentration. Serial sevens test resulted in multiple errors when done by him. He has, he has disorganized speech as well. Which of the following is most appropriate next step in management? Is it a cost-effective laboratory test referred to reference to the geriatric? Uh, admit, admitting the patient into the nursing facility or referring to a psychiatrist? Um, the attendees can, uh, can give the answers in the chat. All right. Okay, we will find out as we go. Right. Acute confusion, confusional status is a common uh, label that we'll see for the next about three topics, I believe. And here we'll, discussing, we'll be discussing delirium, which is a syndrome of acute confusion uh, with fluctuations in attention, uh, fluctuations in con uh, cognition, awareness. Uh, we have features including um, illusions. The patient will see uh, illusions will hallucinate. Mostly you find visual hallucinations in delirium. We have cognitive deficits like memory, just like in the question we've seen just now. Emotional lability, right? And agitation. We have something called the subsyndromal delirium, which is a clinical uh, a set of clinical features not meeting the diagnostic criteria. So this is uh, not a, a diagnostic set, but it's uh, features of uh, delirium so they're they're called subsyndromal symptoms are reversible um we'll see a contrast to that in uh, an upcoming topic but remember that delirium has its symptoms reversible so uh, a diagnostic approach to delirium is using the dsa5 diagnostic criteria for delirium the patient uh, must meet all of the following to be diagnosed. Attention and awareness must be impaired. Acute onset over hours or days with waxing and waning um, of severity. Now, what is waxing and waning? Waxing and waning is basically, um, basically the symptoms will slowly progress and then slowly regress and appear and disappear. So basically on and off sort of... Uh, uh, symptoms uh, appearing in, in the patient. Uh, one or more additional disruption in cognitive uh, functions. For example, memory loss, amnesia, right? There's also slurred speech, uh, disorientation, and so on. Disorientation could be to either time or place. So one of these uh, needs to be present as the diagnostic criterion. Um, after that, we have the uh, condition. Uh, the condition fulfills the following criteria. Um, there must be an absence or of pre-existing dementia. So there is no previous dementia, nor there's a previous coma. Um, a severely reduced responsiveness uh, should not have been reported earlier in this patient as well. So uh, there must be an evidence of an overlying cause of, it, uh, or basically a cause of this condition. This could be uh, physical trauma, could be substance intoxication or substance withdrawal. This could happen with some uh, medication, right? And drugs and so on. We have also ketoacidosis. Now remember, diagnosis of delirium is uh, done clinically. Uh, we do have routine laboratory tests like uh, complete blood count, uh, magnesium, liver chemistry, urinalysis, uh, electrolytes. Now diagnosis, again, is, uh, if delirium is clinical, you clinically identify the underlying uh, factors of delirium, either drugs, 
electrolytes, lack of uh, lack or withdrawal of medication, infection, uh, reduction of sensor, sensorial input, urinalysis, intracranial um, pathology. Uh, there could be myocardial and pulmonary causes as well. So let's pay attention to that. So we return back to this question. Uh, any questions so far from the attendees? All right. So uh, most of the attendees answered with, or not most actually, only half of them answered, referred to uh, geriatrics, only half of you. Um, uh, we'll see the actual answer now. And uh, um, so let's check the answer over here. The answer is in reality A. Now, yes, it, uh, that is uh, partially true. Uh, it is a common case in elderly, but like we mentioned earlier, there's usually always an underlying physiological uh, condition that resulted in delirium. We should do, yes, exactly. We should do the tests before referring because the test will basically reveal the underlying cause. And after, after the tests, we'll then decide to which facility the patient should be referred. Um, if there are no more questions, I'll move on to the next topic. Yes, exactly. To exclude medical conditions. So if you guys have no elaboration, uh, we'll just move on. So that's the first topic that we're done with. We'll move on to the second topic. Again, under the uh, label of acute confusional state, and uh, we have the question for... For this topic, a 70-year-old woman presented with confusion. She is unarousable, that is to say she does not respond to stimuli. Unarousable during the day, but then is awake and impulsive during the night. She is requiring frequent reorientation. Her vital signs are within the normal limits, and her labs are also normal, so normal lab values. She is distressed and oriented to person, but not to time or place. Later on, she became very aggressive and tried to harm herself. What should we do? Uh, what should be done with her? Or what is the? Uh, what should be done with her? Basically, uh, lorazepam, a half milligram, intravenous, haloperidol, half milligram uh, per oral or per os. Lorazepam, one milligram per os. No pharmacological measures are enough. Uh, please proceed to answer in the chat. Okay, so uh, delirium, the treatment approach when it comes to uh, strictly agitation, right? In here we have, now I apologize, I have to move the screen because of a defect that I'm facing. Um, so uh, first we have non-pharmacological -pharmacolo approach, which is a supportive, a, basically an approach to supportive care. Um, approaching someone or arranging for someone to be with the patient at all time. This could be a family member or a, uh, a sitter, basically. Someone who is, uh, who is basically meant to just be for the patient and uh, take care of them. Could be a family member or whoever. Uh, identify or treat the causes of agitation. This could be anything from hunger to pain to uh, simple dehydration or simply loneliness sometimes. Um, De-escalation techniques, basically, we have uh, verbal interaction to calm down the patient, uh, clear communication, anything to basically uh, help the patient get a hold of themselves and uh, calm down. Uh, another approach is the pharmaco pharmacotherapy approach. Uh, sedation should be limited, basically, to patients with severe agitation, severe enough to pose a risk to themselves or others. Right, so it's it's limited to that case. It's not if it's not uh, severe enough to cause any risk, then it, it should be yani, It's it's limited to that case alone. Minimize the risk of worsening delirium with medication. So we use medication to uh, control delirium, basically. Um, and here we have antipsychotics that are used. Um, first line and second line drugs, basically. We have antipsychotics. Typical antipsychotics include halopir haloperidol. This is the most common. Atypical antipsychotics like uh, risperidone, right? And olanzapine as well. These are the typical atypical antipsychotics for the first line management. The second line management is benzodiazepines. 
Now, uh, benzodiazepines are kind of sensitive uh, uh, agents. So they're reserved for patients with alcohol or benzodiazepine withdrawals. Because again, delirium can be caused by, uh, as a withdrawal symptom. Uh, it can, uh, benzodiazepines are also used for a history of neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Um, in benzodiazepines, they prefer, basically, uh, we prefer the use of lorazepam. So uh, returning back to the question, answer the poll. All right, so uh, most of you answered with haloperidol, um, half a milligram per os, or orally. Now, haloperidol um, is the first-line therapy, again, like we mentioned, is uh, from the typical antipsychotics. It is the most commonly used uh, agent. Uh, the, the dose, the set dose can be repeated. Um, so what's the convenient dose of, of lorazepam? Um, I'm not sure to be honest. Oh yes, uh, lorazepam is the second line drug. Uh, but the first line drug is haloperidol. So, so again, as part of the question, what should be done to where the first thing you should consider is the first line treatment, which is in this case, haloperidol. Uh, alternatively, half a milligram intramus uh, intramuscular could be repeated every one hour. Um, so moving on to the third topic, there it is. A 78-year-old patient with Parkinson's disease comes to the physician for a follow-up examination. The patient reports beginning tasks and then forgetting what he was doing. So he forgets what he was doing halfway through the task. He usually doesn't remember events that occurred the day before. Sometimes forgets names of common objects. He has hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and has been smoking for 20 years. Um, the, in regards to his current complaint, which of the following is the strongest risk factor for the development of dementia in this patient? Right? So write in the chat what you think the answer is. All right, bear that in mind. We'll move on to the topic, which is, as you could, have t as you could tell already, it's dementia. Dementia is a major neurocognitive disorder. This uh, previously was called dementia, now it's called uh, major neurocognitive disorder, MND, right? Dementia was the old name. Dementia is an acquired persistent decline of cognitive function that causes impaired performance of daily activities um, without an underlying psychiatric disease, right? So no underlying psychiatric disease causing such issues. So the etiology um, of, could be either neurodegenerative brain diseases, could be either Alzheimer's disease, which is more than 50% of dementia cases, Parkinson's disease, frontotemporal dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, progressive supranuclear palsy, Huntington's disease, which is a, a genetic disorder, among others. Now, uh, there are modifiable risk factors for dementia and non-modifiable uh, risk factors. The modifiable ones include low education attainment, uh, right? So the less educated the patient is, the more likely he is to develop dementia eventually. Um, the same goes for midlife hypertension, midlife obesity, hearing loss, because that causes less uh, audio input, which affects uh, brain functions in the long term. Uh, late life depression, diabetes, physical inactivity, smoking and social isolation. We've seen a couple of these in uh, the question we just uh, read. Um, so again, bear this point in mind. Uh, these are modifiable risk factors. Non-modifiable ones include age. So as a person ages, um, the risk for dementia amplifies basically. Uh, mild cognitive impairment, uh, which is say that older adults with mild cognitive impairment are at risk for progressing to dementia. We have also some genetic disorders, like uh, we did mention Huntington's uh, disease at the very end, you can see over here. So that's a genetic uh, factor, among other factors as well. Um, okay, that was, uh, let's go back to the question. Here's a question, you can read it quickly and then proceed to answer using the poll. All right, that was quick. Um, mashallah, you all answered very quickly. 
and 85% of you answered with older age. Uh, moving on to see the actual answer, which is in fact older age because it is the strongest risk factor for developing uh, dementia, which is exactly what the question was asking over here, the strongest risk factor. So you have it, older age is in fact just that. So any ambiguity there to uh, uh, clear up for any of you or should we just move on? If there's nothing, uh, I'll move on. Um, if I miss uh, clear, okay, wonderful. Okay, so that is dementia, the third topic. Moving on to the fourth topic. Um, okay, so an 82-year-old man was taken to the clinic by his family due to worsening memory and cognitive impairment. Following an extensive ev evaluation and neuropsychological testing, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. What is the earliest symptom that indicates Alzheimer's dementia? So what, what do you all think? The earliest symptom of Alzheimer's dementia. All right, most of you in the chat are already um, writing uh, C. We will discuss this and return back to the question and see um, whether or not it's correct. Alzheimer's dementia. Uh, Alzheimer's dementia is characteristically a disease of older age. So it's characteristically a disease of older age as a person grows up. It is a syndrome of dementia defined by the following characteristics. There's interference with the ability to function at work. So interference with the functioning, basically, or at usual activities. A decline from previous level functioning and performing. So I was saying uh, there's a decline in previous, uh, from a previous level of functioning and performing. So the performance and functioning declines uh, over time. No clear explanation by delirium or major psychiatric disorder. There is cognitive impairment established by history taking from a patient and a knowledgeable informant, right? This informant could be a, uh, a uh, related uh, person, basically a family member. Objective bedside mental status examination and neuropsychologic testing are conducted as well for that purpose. Uh, cognitive impairment involves a minimum of two of the following domains. So two of these needs to be present at least. There is impaired ability to acquire and remember new information. There is impairment reasoning and handling of complex tasks. And there is pure uh, a poor judgment as well. I'm sorry. Poor judgment. There is impairment in uh, visuospatial abilities. So... Uh, just like it sounds, as visual impairments and spatial judgment impairments as well. Impaired language functions, so he forgets uh, certain words or slurs his, slurs his speech suddenly. Um, uh, there's changes in personality, behavior, or comportment, right? So suddenly out of the blue, the patient may become uh, agitated or very easy to, uh, to, uh, to basically uh, make that patient suddenly angry, agitable, as this, uh, so to say, right? Other core clinical criteria include insidious onset, with initial uh, and prominent deficits, cognitive deficits, right? Uh, one of the following. Music presentation, there is uh, problems in learning and memory and recollection, recollection of recently learned information. There's non-amnistic um, presentations, language difficulties, for example, a prominent word finding deficits, again, visual spatial presentation, visual cognitive deficits, could be visual hallucin hallucinations, for example, or a dis, dis executive presentation, a prominent impairment of reasoning, uh, a pro impairment of judgment, and uh, loss of problem solving skills. Memory impairments, specifically loss of memory of recent events, is the most frequent feature of Alzheimer's dementia. It is the first manifestation as well. This is lined in red for an important reason. And uh, yes, the, the question we saw just a minute, a few minutes ago. The poll will show up now. Um, proceed to answer, please. All right. Uh, okay, so we're picking things up. 80% of you have answered with C. We'll move on. The answer, which is indeed C, impairment in learning and recollection of recently learned information. This is 
the, mo the first prominent sign of Alzheimer's dementia, the earliest symptom. So if you guys have no information and, uh, on this topic, we'll need to move on because we need to pick things up. If you have anything, um, I'd advise you to write it on a sheet of paper. Basically, keep the question with you so I may answer uh, your questions at the very end. All right, that's dementia. We'll move on to the fifth topic. An 80-year-old man has a history of two years of progressive gait disturbances and incontinence as well. Uh, they have been attributed to old age and prostatism. Within the past three months, he has been forgetful, confused, and withdrawn. His guide has is short step, and he turns around very slowly, almost toppling over. He has a history of trauma, a head trauma, 30 years ago, or since 30 years. What is the probable diagnosis? Could be frontotemporal dementia, Alzheimer's dementia, Creutzfeldt Jakob disease, or normal pressure hydrocephalus. Uh, we'll see. So, <laughs> normal pressure hydrocephalus. Um, this refers to a condition of pathologically enlarged ventricular size with normal opening pressures on lumbar puncture. So, I'm, f I'm sure you're all familiar with the ventricles in the brain uh, region. Uh, in terms of anatomy and all. So this is basically an, an enlarged ventricle, ventricular size with normal opening pressures. Uh, NPH is a form of communicating hydrocephalus. Clinical features include guide difficulty, cognitive disturbance, and urinary incontinence. So here is a table basically summarizing the differential diagnosis of uh, subtypes of dementia. Now we can see here Alzheimer's, uh, vascular dementia, dementia of Lewy bodies, frontotemporal dementia, and normal hydrocephalus dementia. Starting with uh, Alzheimer's uh, disease, we can see that the course of disease, uh, it progresses slowly over eight to 10 years, right? Distinctive features include episodic impairment of memory, again, in episodes, uh, characteristic order of language impairment, basically starts to forget the names first and then Comprehension uh, suffers and eventually fluency kind of uh, goes out the door. Um, studies and imaging. AD is a clinical diagnosis, as we had discussed earlier. Diffuse cortical atrophy is found. Hippocampal atrophy and cerebrospinal fluid will show decreased beta amyloid but increased phosphorylated um, tau. Uh, uh, Tau bodies, if you're aware of those. Um, pathology, um, essentially there's neuritic plaques, amyloid beta peptides, uh, mainly accumulating extracellularly. Neurofib neurofibrillary uh, tangles, which are phosphorylated tau proteins, accumulate intracellularly. Now vascular dementia may present as abrupt cognitive decline and stepwise deterioration. But um, like I said here, it is kind of rapid. Uh, distinctive clinical features include asymm asymmetric or focal deficits, like hemiparesis, for example. Half of the body uh, suddenly, be basically hemiparesis, right? Studies and imaging. CT, MRI usually show lacunar infarcts. Uh, pathology is clear because it's unknown. Dementia with Lewy bodies um, shows that there's a steady decline, typically over eight to 10 years, but more rapid progression is um, possible. It has been observed. Um, distinctive clinical features include visual hallucinations and Parkinsonian motor disorders. There's attention impairment as well. In studies and imaging, there's something we call a SPEC test. This may reveal decreased occipital perfusion or decreased metabolism, right? The pathology of Lewy body dementia is thought that uh, Lewy bodies um, will start stressing out the neurons in the brain. Lewy bodies are basically aggregations of alpha synuclein um, uh, particles. They start accumulating and aggregating uh, intracellularly. There's what we call frontotemporal dementia. This usually manifests between the ages of 40 and 69. Um, we have um, 
clinical features include behavioral uh, variant said disease, which is more common. We have early changes in personality and uh, apathy. All right. So uh, cerebrospinal CSF, usually alpha, beta uh, increases to 1 of 42. Uh, if PT or CT scan will reveal metabolic disorders in the frontal, temporal, and, uh, frontal and temporal lobes. Uh, there's the pathology involves uh, focal uh, cortical atrophy, normal pressure hydros hydrocephalus, uh, potentially reversible, potentially. There's classical uh, triad, uh, clinical triad of clinical features, gait disorder, dementia, urinary incontinence. Um, CT, MRI is used. There's relative dilation of ventricles, preventricular hyper uh, intensities. Lumbar puncture alleviates symptoms. There is unspecific cerebral atrophy as well, right? So moving on, I suppose you know the answer to this by now. Uh, roll the poll anyway. Normal pressure hydrocephalus. All right. That is indeed the answer. Um, so we'll move on to the next topic because uh, we're getting um, short of time. So we have the sixth topic right now. A 56-year-old diabetic patient came to the clinic for an annual diabetic neuropathy uh, screening. He has, he has had diabetes for 13 years and is now complaining with, uh, or compliant, sorry, with taking his medication. So he, he does comply with treatment. What is the most appropriate test which could be done for this patient? Albumin creatinine ratio, microalbuminuria, granulator filtration rate, or glucose urine test. Uh, we'll see what that is. Uh, screening recommendation for diabetic neuropathy. Screening for microalbuminuria with a spot urine albumin creatinine ratio identifies the early stages of neuropathy, of nephropathy, I'm sorry. Did I say neuropathy? Well, Oh, sorry, my bad. This is nephropathy, not neuropathy. Diabetes does uh, cause nephropathy. So screening for uh, diabetic nephropathy, uh, screening starts with microalbuminuria with spot urine albumin creatinine ratio. This identifies the early stages of nephropathy. Positive results of, on two or three tests, 30 to 300 mi uh, milligram of of albumin per gram of creatinine in a six month period meets diagnostic criteria for diabetic nephropathy. So that line in red is important, keep that in mind. Uh, because diabetic nephropathy may also manifest as decreased uh, GFR, right? Or an increased serum creatinine level, these tests should be included in annual monitoring. That is the GFR and serum creatinine level. If microalbuminuria is present, screening must be repeated annually, right? So that's long story short. So uh, the most appropriate test that could be done for this patient, roll the poll. The most appropriate test is albumin creatinine ratio, because we said it is the, we'll actually go back to the screen and explain why, right? Um, screening for microalbuminuria, using a test called spot urine albumin creatinine ratio, right? So this is a test. Um, so this clearly identifies early stages of nephropathy. It is the most sensitive in this regards. So it is definitely A, right? Moving on to the seventh topic, um, a 52-year-old patient did a screening colonoscopy. It shows that the patient is having a polyp with a size of 1.5 centimeters. The doctor then performed a biopsy that showed tubular adenoma. What should the interval screening uh, for this patient be? Right? Either he doesn't need or uh, interval of six months or every three years or every five to 10 years. Uh, put your answers in the chat or keep them in your mind. We'll move We'll move on to the topic at hand. Um, screening recommendation. Uh, here's a follow-up surveillance colonoscopy, basically. This table summarizes uh, surveillance and screening, in, uh, screening intervals, right? 
So if there was no polyps found, recommended screening interval is 10 years. So once every 10 years. Quality of evidence supporting this uh, yeah, the, this line in here shows the quality of evidence, basically what was used to um, support this recommendation. Uh, right, so a small uh, polyp that is less than 10 millimeters, hyperplastic polyps in rectum or sigmoid, again, once every 10 years. Uh, one to two small polyps that are less than uh, 10 millimeters, it's not just one, it's one or two, one to two, right? Tubular adenomas. This one is five to 10 years. Three to 10 tubular adenomas, three years, uh, more than 10 adenomas. Um, more frequent than one every 10 years, basically. One or more tubular adenoma that are more than 10 centimeters, one or more, uh, once every three years. One or more villous adenoma on every three years. Adenoma, so basically three years until you reach serrated lesions. Um, Sessile serrated polyps, which are less than 10 millimeters with no dysplasia, once every five years. Uh, there's, there should be screened for. Um, however, if they're larger than 10 millimeters, it should be once every three years. If there were sessile serrated polyps with dysplasia, or they uh, uh, show traditional serrated adenomas, that's still once every three years. If there's serrated polyp syndrome, right, that is ev uh, basically annually, once every year. So uh, there the question goes again, uh, roll the poll, or should be the interval of screening for this patient. Um, all right, we have a variety of answers this time. 41%, um, however, answered six months. So uh, the question um, talks about a size of a polyp of 1.5 centimeters, tubular adenoma. The answer is actually three years. So once every three years, because going back to the table over here, uh, one or more tubular adenoma with more than 10 millimeters once every three years. That's basically what we have here. This one is 15 millimeters technically and should be once every three years. Okay, so moving on to the eighth topic. A 52 year old female who is free from chronic diseases and medical complaints came to the clinic for colon cancer screening. The patient doesn't have relevant family history uh, of colon cancer. Which choice from below is the most appropriate to screen her? Either fecal occult blood annually, colonoscopy every five years, sigmoidoscopy every 10 years, or no need for screening. Um, bear that in mind. All right. So again, the recommendations, uh, colonoscopy screening recommendations for high-risk patients. So men and women, if they are symptomatic, we have a diagnostic workup. They're asymptomatic regardless of age, but they show positive family history. Uh, we have these scenarios. Okay, so uh, if, if in asymptomatic uh, patients, they'll go through investigations. Uh, based, there's what we call the hereditary non-polyposis non colorectal cancer test. So genetic counseling, if uh, after that, genetic counseling and spatial screening, um, HNPCC colonoscopy every one to two years um, or 10 years younger. That's the earliest case in the family, whichever. All right, so moving on to this, that was basically an overview, I suppose. Um, screen recommendation, colonoscopy screen recommendation for average risk patients. Screening age is generally recommended for all individuals aged beyond 50 years. Recent guidelines suggest that uh, screening 45 years of age uh, for individuals at average risk. Um, so you can see it's indicated. Uh, that's the recent guidelines. Criteria for average risk of uh, colonoscopy, um, sorry, uh, CRC, basically colorectal cancer. Uh, no history of CRC, inflammatory bowel disease, or adenomatous uh, polyps. No family history of hereditary colon cancer syndromes. So that's a criteria for the average uh, risk. Uh, mode of screening is uh, fecal occult blood testing annually, flexible sigmoidoscopy every five years, fecal occult blood testing annually, and flexible every five years, flexible sigmoidoscopy every five years. 
um, double contrast barium enema every five to 10 years and colonoscopy every 10 years. Now consider individual risk factors and patient preferences and cost effective effectiveness. So we never do these all at once, right? All positive non-colonoscopy screening tests uh, should be followed up with timely colonoscopy as part of the screening process. Now, repeating positive uh, non-colonoscopy tests is not acceptable. Uh, this question over here, run the poll. All right, uh, 53, basically half of you said fecal occult uh, blood annually. Now, the answer is exactly that, fecal occult blood annually. So yes, returning back, we said that the mode of screening uh, fecal occult blood uh, testing annually. The ones after those are if every five years and so on. Again, this patient is also uh, free of chronic diseases and medical complaints. Jesus came for screening. So moving on to the ninth topic, a 46-year-old female came to the clinic for breast screening. She is not complaining of breast lumps or any abnormalities with her breast. She's also medically well and not suffering from any chronic diseases. She has been smoking for 18 years. Her mother had breast cancer. She is now concerned because of that about the risks that she may have developed the cancer too. What is the appropriate screening for her at this time? Is it mammogram, colonoscopy, uh, HRCT, or all of the above? We'll see what that is. Um, so breast cancer, who are we screening for? We have high-risk patients and we have low-risk patients. A high-risk patient is a personal uh, patient having a personal history of ovarian uh, cancer, peritoneal cancer, including tubal cancer or breast cancer, or family history of said cancers, or genetic predisposition like the BRCA gene or other genetic marker status. Um, uh, radi radiotherapy to the chest between age 10 and 30. Uh, women with personal history or family history of uh, cancer syndromes. Cancer syndromes, Lee Froyman syndrome or Cowden syndrome. We have women beyond 35 years of age with previous invasive breast cancer or carcinoma in situ. These are the high risk patients. The low risk patients or average risk patients rather are any women not fulfilling the high risk criteria. Mammography is the primary modality for breast cancer screening in average risk women. Right? Now, uh, in here, between this, these are women with average risk. So we did mention over here that uh, mammography is the primary modality for average risk women. In here, between the uh, age of 40 and 49, we have ultrasound for women. With 40 or 49 years, decision, a decision should be made uh, as an individual one. Patient benefits from early diagnosis. This should outweigh, outweigh the potential harm, basically, of radiation exposure. So uh, and the American Scanner Society uh, says that between 40 and 44 years, they can choose to start annual ma mammography. Between 49, 45 and 49, they should start annual mammography. And annual mammography screen is, uh, screening and clinical breast exams are conducted. Are, are conducted sorry. In 50 to 75 years, mammography screening every two years. And the American Cancer Society says that 50 to 54 years, they should conduct annually uh, mammography. Uh, 55 years, uh, mammography screening every two years. Uh, or continue annual screening if desired. Now, uh, just like the previous one, we have mammography and clinical exam, 75 years or beyond. No sufficient data if benefits outweigh harm in this patient's group. According to this uh, first column in the uh, American Cancer Society, they should continue screening as long as the patient is physically well and expected to live for the or for beyond 10 years. Um, yes. However, if uh, women are at high risk, regardless of the age, begin screening at uh, around 40 years of age, um, according to the USPSDF. According to the cancer, American Cancer Society, uh, annual MRI and mammography screening should start at uh, the age of 30. At, um, according to ACOG, the clinical breast exam should be done every two years and annual MRI and mammography. 
again, here's a question uh, from the poll. So 100% of you answered uh, mammography or mammogram, which is exactly what we should do. All right. Uh, the final topic, uh, we have a 66-year-old heavy smoker that has been smoking for 10 to 20 years that came to the clinic for checkup. Um, he smoked two packs daily and has had hypertension uh, for, for 12 years now. Uh, what is the most appropriate screening investigation to start with according to his case? Is it osteoporosis screening? Is it colon cancer screening? Is it abdominal aortic aneurysm screening or prostate cancer? Now, a screening recommendation, we have aortic uh, aneurysm screening guidelines. An abdominal aortic aneurysm or AAA uh, is an aortic enlargement with a diameter of three centimeters or larger. Most AAAs are asymptomatic until they rupture. Although the risk of rupture varies greatly by aneurysm size, the associated risk for death with rupture is as high as 81%. The USPSTF recommends uh, one-time screening for AAA with ultrasonography in men aged 65 to 75 years who have ever smoked. So if they have ever scrum, they, uh, smoked, they are recommended to have one-time screening between said ages. Clinicians selectively offer screening for AAA with ultrasonography in men aged 65 to 75 years who have never smoked. The US uh, PSDF recommends against routine screening for AAA with ultrasonography in women who have never smoked and have no family history of aortic aneurysm. Uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm. So they recommend against it in women who have never smoked and have no family history. USPSTF concludes that the current evidence is insufficient to assess a balance and benefit of, uh, of benefit and harm uh, for the screening with ultrasonography in women aged 65 to 75 years who have ever smoked or have a family history of AAA. So these women who have smoked or have family history um, ultrasonography for them is not exactly sufficient, according to the USPSDF. All right, so that was uh, rather quick. Um, again, here's a question Heavy smoker male. Oh, run the poll. Polls. All right. So 95% answered with uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm, 5% answered with prostate cancer. Abdominal aortic aneurysm is the answer here because we're looking, uh, he's been smoking for 20 years. He's 66 year old male. Um, so the answer is exactly uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm. The, uh, the question here says, why not prostate cancer? Because, uh, well, the reason is because um, prostate cancer is not exactly, or colon cancer for that matter, so yeah, and here we're focused actually on um, cases of heavy smokers. You can see they're asymptomatic until they rupture, right? The risk of death is rather high, and it's usually among smokers. And our patient has a heavy smoker, as the, clay, the case clearly states, two packs a day for the past 12 years. Uh, exactly, because hypertension is greater risk in this, this case. Yes, because we're mainly concerned about hypertension. The other, the other um, options are less dependent on the fact that the patient smokes and more dependent on other, uh, other factors, all right? So these are the, uh, all the 10 topics, hopefully uh, clear to you. Uh, these, these are my references. Um, thank you for, for attending and listening. Thank you so much.